introduction for those that aren't familiar with MFS. We are a global investment manager based in Boston, managing just shy of 500 billion in total assets. And we're probably most well known as inventing the original mutual fund in 1924. I'd like to begin by saying MFS has been incorporating ESG into our investment process for a very long time. However, incorporating ESG into our process and actually articulating that process to clients and prospects are obviously two very different things. So my objective today is to introduce the idea of ESG, which stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance, and the various ways it's being discussed within the plan sponsor community today. And to be clear, there's no right way. Uh, the goal is simply to educate you on different ways we're seeing ESG being incorporated. So the reality is how you integrate ESG is very dependent on your specific plan and the demographics of your participants. And Steve, if you could move to slide two, please. ESG is becoming increasingly important for plan sponsors and the participants as more participants, particularly younger ones, would like their investments to encourage companies to behave in sustainable and responsible ways. Plan sponsors are seeing this as a potential way to increase participant engagement and ultimately participation in saving, savings rates, which we obviously support. Many investment managers view SG, ESG excuse me, as a product conversation and while there's nothing inherently wrong with that view at MFS, our view is that plan sponsors have the opportunity to employ a new model to address ESG. We believe by, <clears throat> by doing so, plan sponsors will be in a stronger position to help their participants achieve their retirement goals while also addressing their evolving preferences of their participants. So several things we're going to highlight today. First, motivate the conversation by putting numbers around the ESG movement. I refer to that as a movement because as opposed to a trend, we think that you'll notice it really appears that this issue is here to stay. Second, we'll highlight the challenging situation that both consultants and plan sponsors find themselves in as they look to address the issue. And finally, we'll then propose a new way to think about making ESG decisions and wrap up with some next steps you might consider in terms of taking actual action. Uh, Steve, if you could please move to slide three. So in many of our conversations with DC plan sponsors, and, and Steve, if you want to actually, I think if you click multiple times, you'll there you go, all the issues. Uh, in speaking with some of the plan sponsors, we know that you face a host of challenges, including participant education, plan operations, and all the other fiduciary responsibilities surrounding investment performance, cost containment, and in general, the overall fiduciary process. What we're hearing from our DC clients, not only here in the US, but also globally, is the growing interest and consideration of ESG strategies within their DC plan. The challenge, however, is that many plan sponsors essentially feel stuck. They're hearing from their participants that they want to have a dialogue around the ESG component of their investments, but plan sponsors have a lot of other priorities that they're focused on. If you could please move to slide four. ESG is a global trend that has generated a lot of attention over the past decade from governments, investment managers, plan sponsors, and now represents a significant amount of global assets. The Principles for Responsible Investment, or PRI, is a leading proponent of responsible investing supported by the United Nations. They report that the number of organizations signing on to commit to their six principles of responsible investing has grown from 63 in 2006 to 1,823 signatories today, and that includes 363 asset owners, 1,229 investment managers, and 231 service providers, representing more than 68 trillion in assets under management. While this trend has been going on for many years outside the US, most notably in Europe and Australia, it is certainly growing in importance here in the US. And according to the Forum for Sustainable and Responsible Investment, U.S. domiciled assets under management using socially responsible or sustainable investing grew to $8.7 trillion in 2016, which is a 33% increase over 2014 levels. I'd also add that data providers have grown substantially from a few niche players to over 100 providers, including mainstream providers like MSCI, Bloomberg, and Thomson Reuters. More recently, Morningstar has incorporated the data from sustainable analytics into their manager research process, continuing the trend towards more mainstream integration of ESG. 
And finally, as DC plans represent the primary retirement savings vehicle and often the largest pool of assets for most Americans, other than their primary residence, DC plan sponsors are recognizing the need to address this, particularly as the millennial generation becomes a more substantial percentage of the workforce. Steve, if you can move to slide five, please. So ESG considerations are not likely to go away, and we think they're more likely to accelerate as millennials represent a growing portion of the workforce and begin making their way into decision-making roles within their own firms. DC plan sponsors must develop a thoughtful approach to demonstrate and communicate their approach to ESG considerations. And we believe that if you aren't getting ESG questions from participants today, you likely will in the near future. I'd also add, just as an FYI, or to keep in mind, as you're seeing on this slide, it's not just millennials that are expressing interest in ESG. As you can see from some of these charts, the general population also has a genuine interest into ESG as well. If you could please move to slide six. Okay, so now I'm gonna to transition to the challenges in addressing ESG and DC plans. And in short, what can you do as a plan sponsor? Well, it's not easy. <laughs> and as you'll see on slide seven, we've identified three approaches to ESG. Uh, you can basically do nothing. You can use a product which is most usually managed by removing companies that plans and participants deem to be harmful or negative to society, which might include tobacco, alcohol, or firearms. Or you can use a process to integrate ESG into an actual DC plan. As I mentioned in my opening comments, there's not a right or wrong answer on product versus process. In our view, though, incorporating a product solution is difficult because most participants have differing opinions on what's important to them. So, for example, some participants may be most interested in clean water, while others may be more interested in human rights. So finding a product that fulfills all of those goals may be difficult to find. If you could please move to slide eight. Plan sponsors have to balance the need to satisfy their participant preferences while meeting their responsibilities toward offering the best investment menu for their participants. On the one hand, they have a responsibility towards their investment policy and investment committee, in which they're focused on selecting a strong investment menu. And as we all know, investment returns represent the majority of a participant's accumulated balance at retirement. So this is obviously a very important component. However, on the other hand, they have a growing population that would really like their investments to encourage companies to behave in sustainable and responsible ways. So you please move to page nine. All right, so I'm gonna turn the mic over to my colleague, Sean, to further explain how MFS thinks about incorporating ESG into a DC plan. Great, thanks, Jim. And uh, thank you all for, for joining us and having this conversation. It's an important conversation and one that we've been engaged in for quite some time at MFS. And as I transition the conversation, as Jim had said, to talking about a new model, I think it's important to share a little bit of perspective around why we're proposing and talking about this new model. And Jim said at the beginning that uh, there are challenges to implement implementing product solutions in this conversation uh, for DC plans. And if you look at this globally, there's a huge global appetite for investing in companies that behave in sustainable and responsible ways. That's something that Jim has ago. But it's much easier in a defined benefit plan, in an endowment, in foundation assets to implement a product solution because you can build separate accounts, you can screen specific securities that you might see to be particularly bad actors in society. But in a defined contribution structure, it's actually quite challenging, particularly because most of the time, uh, your participants are investing in pooled vehicles, mutual funds, maybe collective investment trusts, but you're not necessarily in a position to spe specifically pick individual securities that you wanna screen out because they're sitting in a pooled vehicle. So as we were talking with clients for well over 10 years on this topic globally, we were really trying to figure out how do we help clients address this issue in a way that's authentic to what their stakeholders want, uh, while simultaneously achieving the investment objectives that they have as fiduciaries on behalf of their either retirement plan or foundation or assets or foundation or endowment portfolios. And that's what really led us to this conversation around a new model. And the background uh, towards this new model 
really starts with uh, an engagement that we've had at MFS with the academic community for many years, and in particular with MIT. So M MIT is a, as you may know, a research institute here in Boston. In fact, I'm looking out of my office window at MIT's campus. So we're not only close proximity wise, but uh, we're close in terms of a lot of the issues that they're looking to tackle. And one of the issues that they're looking to tackle at MIT is this idea around responsible business and uh, understanding the, the role business plays in society. And they have a research initiative over there called the MIT Sustainability Initiative. And this is a multidisciplinary research center at MIT that's focused on what is the role of business in society. Um, you know, even if it's to maximize stakeholder, uh, shareholder value, how does that impact stakeholders? And the sustainability initiative is really unpacking the different effects that business has on various stakeholders, whether it's shareholders, employees, local communities, suppliers, and whatnot. So we actually went to MIT with this problem and said, look, we've got a group we align with the broader objectives of society. However, in a retirement plan, like a defined contribution plan, it's very challenging. And one of the things that we feel passionately about as long-term investors is that you actually can invest responsibly and invest with an understanding of the environmental impacts, the social impacts, and the governance impacts that, that stocks and bonds will have um, on the broader society while still trying to maximize shareholder return. But we, we really struggled with how do we communicate this to our clients and then ultimately how do you as a plan sponsor and as a fiduciary communicate this to your participant? And so it was really this journey that we went on with MIT as we explored how do we actually go about communicating that a process approach, implementing environmental, social, and governance research into the investment process actually can be a win-win. It actually can be a way to maximize shareholder return while simultaneously investing alongside organizations that are perpetuating the broader objectives of society. And the first thing that they, they, they shared with us that we sort of recognized through that exploration was a very deeply entrenched mental model that all of us take into this conversation. And when I say all of us, it's because this is a mental model that human beings tend to possess whenever you're talking about things like diversity or uh, improving society. And Steve, if you go to the next slide, this is a good representation of what I'm talking about. What, what they helped us understand through some of the research that they've done through the psychology department at MIT and some of the um, uh, multidisciplinary research at the sustainability initiative was that human beings are, are trained in terms of trade-offs. That's particularly true for investors because investors are trained in terms of trade-offs. Risk and return is a trade-off that everyone who's an investor understands. What's interesting is that the, the research that MIT spent a lot of time on was that this trade-off doesn't just exist with investing. Actually, when, when we talk about things like improving diversity or improving society, we believe as humans, we have this mental model that necessarily there's a trade-off to some sort of return objective. So if we're gonna do good by society, there has to be a cost. If you're gonna promote more diversity or more social inclusion, there has to be a cost. And so we wanted to test that model. And what we did as we sort of explored that model was really worked with MIT and even internally here at MF, MFS around a number of different scenarios. And on the next slide, you can see us testing, uh, does this mental model exist and is it accurate? And what we have here is on the vertical axis, you have performance and on the horizontal axis, you have societal value. And what we're depicting with this 45 degree line is that there is in fact a trade-off. If you were to improve societal value, you'd be moving along that curve and compromising performance to improve societal value. The question is, is it an accurate model? And uh, you know, a good example of this would be Walmart. So Walmart is the second largest employer in the world, second only to the Chinese government. And uh, Walmart's biggest input cost as a low cost retailer is labor. And there was a number of years ago where 
Walmart really got beat up for a long time because of their labor practices. They felt, uh, many felt that they were underpaying their workers and that they weren't creating a, a very inclusive labor environment. And so Walmart really kind of got beat up on the S portion of ESG, the societal portion of ESG. Well, if Walmart decided overnight that they were gonna pay their employees double, overnight they'd become a less profitable company because overnight they would basically double their input costs and wouldn't necessarily generate any value from that other than just maybe uh, make the stakeholders happy. But what might happen in three years, in five years, in seven years? Actually, what might happen is by compensating employees more, Walmart might recruit more talented employees. They might retain employees for longer. They might generate more productivity out of those employees and ultimately generate more profit per square foot, which is how retail companies are, are valued in the market. And ultimately what they would become is, is the Costco model. And Costco has long been sort of enamored by Wall Street because of the way that they treat labor like an asset and actually generate more profit per square foot because of the way they treat, train, and recruit uh, labor into their organization. And so on the next slide, what you see is that in fact, in the short run, this trade-off exists. Profitable company. But actually in the long run, there's a win-win. In the long run, organizations, companies that understand factors that are material to their business, like laborers for Walmart, understanding those factors and investing in those factors and performing very high on those factors is a way to not only maximize shareholder value but also maximize societal value and it was this epiphany as we had this conversation with with mit and, and look, talked about their research and, and what they've learned we shared what we've learned and our implicit belief that in the long run if you're focused on the long run understanding environmental factors understanding social factors understanding the governance factors of every company you're looking to invest in is table stakes it's just good research that uh that investment managers are, are doing. But you don't have to just take our word for it. You can actually look at the academic community who's been researching this topic as well. And if you move to the next slide, what you'll see is a, a, a one-page readout of a large multi-year meta-study that's been conducted at Harvard Business School. And George Serafim was the, the lead professor, lead researcher on this research. And what they tested was uh, do companies that perform well on factors that are material to their business outperform those that underperform? And a little bit of background here is what they basically, what they identified through many years of research was that uh, different industries have different factors that are material factors on the dimension of environmental, social, and governance factors to a business. And it was a gentleman by the name of Bob Eccles who uh, was a Harvard Business School professor, spent many, many years trying to research if building products, screen products, would generate better performance than non-screen products, and they really couldn't prove it. And the reason they couldn't prove it was because investing in stocks and bonds are so much more multi-dimensional and so time-dependent that identifying whether environmental factors or social factors and screening them out was really difficult to demonstrate. And so what they did is uh, that actually created the basis for what's called the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board, SASB. And what SASB does, and Bob Eccles was chair of SASB for many years, what SASB does is it looks industry by industry and says, okay, within the transportation industry, what environmental, social, and governance factors are material to that industry? And then it goes to the uh, technology industry, and it goes to um, retailing industry, because every industry has different factors that are material on the dimensions of ESG. For example, if it's a transportation company, carbon, their carbon footprint and fuel costs are gonna be hugely material to a transportation company, it's really not gonna be very material to a technology company, vice versa, 
you know, labor equality and social equality in a technology company is a much bigger issue than it is with transportation. So, so what SASB's done and what George Seraphim did with this Harvard Business Study was they looked at companies and said on companies that perform, and, and they basically bucketed companies that perform high and low on these material and then immaterial factors related to ESG. And so implicitly you would think obviously companies that perform low on both material and immaterial factors perform the worst. Their stock performs the worst. And that's exactly what you see. So in this four quadrant uh, area you see here, the bottom left quadrant is exactly that. So it's looking at companies that have performed low on factors that are material to their business and companies that have performed low on factors that are immaterial to their business. Again, this is on the dimensions of ES and G and they perform the worst, negative 2.9% return. What's surprising about this though is that you might expect companies that performed high on both dimensions to perform best. So companies that perform high on material ESG factors and companies that perform high on immaterial factors would perform best. But actually, it's not, they aren't the ones that perform best. They, they did perform better than the, than the low performers but the ones that performed the best by almost a function of three times were the companies that performed high on material ESG factors, but low on immaterial factors. They outperformed by almost three times the next best uh, quadrant. And the reason for that is what these companies know well, like Walmart, for example, with labor, they know what factors are material to their business and they're investing in, that, in those factors. So, for example, if you're if you're Walmart, really fixing the issue uh, it has a huge impact. And if they, over the next three, five, seven years, actually realize that impact, they could have a huge impact not only in society but on their stock price because they can generate more productivity per square foot and generate more return for their shareholders. If they were to focus on something that really didn't move the needle either for society or for Walmart, it, that's what's called greenwashing. And greenwashing is a term that uh, Wall Street is very focused on right now because a lot of stocks, a lot of companies are focused on reporting things that sound good on paper, but really don't move the needle in terms of both the stock or in terms of improving society. So what we're suggesting through this, uh, through this research is that by integrating ESG research and focusing on materiality, understanding what factors are material to a company, incorporating that into research and focusing on a long-term perspective and understanding what the long-term impact of E, of ES, and the G factors in a company are, you actually can achieve a win-win and, and be investing alongside very uh, responsible companies while simultaneously maximizing the risk return objectives of a fiduciary. And if you move to the next slide, what we what we share here is an example from M, one of MFS's portfolio. Uh, Zimmer Biomet is a medical device company that had been a top holding for many years in a number of our global equity portfolios. And we had a lot of conviction in this company because it was in an attractive industry. Uh, the medical equipment industry is a good industry because it provides secular exposure to trends like aging demographics and diabetes and obesity. Um, certainly a, a market segment that really needs good quality companies solving really big problems for for consumers. But they had a sustainability rating of triple C by one of the largest sustainability data providers. And triple C, if you're not familiar, is not a good rating. <laughs> it's, it's about as low a rating as you can get. <clears throat> and the reason it was triple C rated by MSCI was that quite frankly, it was in the medical device industry. And the medical device industry is often uh, challenged with a lot of product recalls. And Zimmer Biomet was no exception to that. And when you're putting medical devices in human beings' bodies, from an S perspective, from a societal perspective, MSCI doesn't think very highly of that. The challenge is, is that this is a really important industry that needs long-term capital that's solving important societal issues, that's generating really attractive returns and are high quality businesses. So from our perspective, from a return, an investment perspective, it's, an, it's an a company and an industry that, that we wanna make sure we're, we're investing in. 
And so what we did to get comfortable and understand Zimmer Biomed is we engaged with senior management. We talked with senior management about our concerns about their supply chain, or about their product recall issues. We engaged our own internal research team to really understand those issues. We actually visited the manufacturing facilities to understand how they're addressing safety and the safety protocols. We developed a lot of understanding for how they're investing in safety and, and making sure that uh, product recalls are minimized and ultimately even applied a discount to their earnings model to represent the, the risk that a product recall could have um, an impact on their business. And ultimately, we became you know, very highly convicted in this, in this stock, invested in this stock for many, many years in our global portfolios and generate a lot of returns for our clients in this stock. And the reason I share this with you is if, if we had simply looked at it from a product perspective and said, we're not going to invest in any companies that weren't highly rated by the rating providers on ESG, no one would invest in the stock. So there would be no long-term capital investing in an organization that's solving huge societal issues. There'd be no long-term capital investing alongside a really highly qual high quality business that's in an attractive industry with secular trends on its um, uh, you know, on its behalf and ultimately leaving a lot of return on the table. And so this is a great example of uh, negative screening and, and taking a product approach can be the right solution for some clients where they have a very clear societal or environmental point of view. But for most clients, they want to invest in high quality companies that are responsible organizations that also can generate a good return. And Zimmer and Biomet would be a great example of that. So I share that example because often we get questions when we have conversations with clients around, you know, what, what examples can you share um, where implementing this into the process is different than it would be just putting it into a product solution. And this is a great example of that. So that leads us to the, the next slide, which is one of our final slides, which really talks about the decision that you as a plan sponsor have to make between what's the right approach. Is it a product approach or is it a process approach? From a product approach, if you're going to take more of a negative screening approach, uh, we highlight here that it satisfies participant demand, this growing demand for responsible investing because you're offering dedicated product on the menu. So you can communicate to your participants that, hey, if you're interested in an environmentally or socially friendly stock or, or, or portfolio, we have one on our menu, <clears throat> or we have multiple on our menu, and that can be perfectly fine. This works well for plan sponsors who have a consistent set of ESG beliefs among their participants. So for example, if you're a Catholic institution, um, if you're uh, in clean energy, you know, a, a portfolio that divests from a lot of carbon polluters makes really good sense and it's something that your participants would likely want being uh, so committed to the clean energy space. So for those plan sponsors and those organizations that have that homogenous set of beliefs among their participants, a product solution can be a great solution. And it's something that you can stand behind and communicate with conviction to all of your participants. On the other hand, as Jim pointed out, many plant sponsors don't have that luxury. Many plant sponsors have participants that have a very heterogeneous set of beliefs. One set of participants might have interest in labor equality, another might have firearms, another one might be tobacco, another one could be uh, carbon, or it could be the topic du jour that that's you know the most recent issue of the day. This is where the defined contribution structure becomes a little more challenged and where an integrated approach can often be a really good solution because you can offer products and incorporate material ESG factors into your investment process. Your opportunity to communicate with your participants is that, look, we have a, a lot of different issues in the world and we choose to work with investment managers and with a an advisor and consultant that helps us understand our investment managers and how they incorporate all of these factors into their long-term research. So these are the decisions that is becoming increasingly more uh, challenging for plan sponsors to do. So the, and the action you take will be slightly different based on these different 
um, decision modes. So for example, if you're going to go a product approach, you really have to determine what is the criteria you want to divest from. Do you have consistency in your participant base that that's a stance that you want to take as a organization, as a plan sponsor, and then communicate to your participants? So if you want to communicate to your participants, we're going to minimize carbon and you want to invest in companies that uh, have low carbon footprints. That can certainly be a, an avenue that plan sponsors take. You want to make sure that that's something that you as an organization, as a plan sponsor, want to stand behind. From an integration perspective, you really have to think about how do we develop a process for evaluating material ESG factors with our, the investment managers that we partner with. Obviously, consultants and advisors are really helpful in either of these scenarios, but it's just a different next step that you'd have to take from a governance perspective on behalf of your plan. So on the, on the last slide, we just highlight a few different next steps, and this is a maybe a good slide to land on before we open up the questions. But what we often see in terms of next steps is um, adopting a formal questionnaire, particularly for if you're going the process approach. You can adopt the formal questionnaire Oftentimes, your advisors and consultants will help you put this together, and it'll be part of the due diligence that you ask of the managers in your investment menu. Um, sometimes, uh, plan sponsors will actually adopt a formal policy statement and put it into their investment policy statement. It could be a paragraph, it could be a sentence, but that, that reflects the fact that um, this is something that you're evaluating and, and um, uh, taking seriously. We've seen some plan sponsors go to the extent of de de uh, developing a dedicated ESG committee. This is a pretty extreme approach, but we have seen a, a handful of plan sponsors here in the US do that. And, uh, and they work sort of hand in hand with the investment committee of the DC program. And finally, and, and perhaps most importantly, whatever it is you decide to do is really being thoughtful around communicating your approach to your participants. <clears throat> and we say here, leverage your partners because you've got uh, great advisors, consultants, and ultimately the managers within the program that, that you would have vetted should be able to help you do that. As an example, we have a dedicated site on our webpage. We publish an annual sustainability report that talks about all the things that we're doing from an integrated perspective to, um, to meet that win-win solution for you and your participants. So your, your partners likely have a lot of resources to help you as you craft your communication to your plans or to your participants. So I'll, I'm going to stop there. I think we still have a good amount of time for Q&A. And, and Steve, we'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. Thank you very much, Sean. A um, couple of questions have come in uh, via chat, so we want to uh, address those first. Um, and then again, if you have any questions, we'll open up the phone lines uh, for any additional questions that have come through. Um, the first question is, uh, what are you seeing other plan sponsors uh, do to incorporate ESG into their retirement plan? Um, I'll give you my take, and then uh, we'll let uh, Jim and Sean answer that as well. Um, so from a consultant standpoint, uh, like Jim and Sean mentioned, you know, there is no right or wrong answer. Uh, again, I think it's, it's up to the client and the client's um, decision in terms of risk mitigation, again, uh, with regard to employee engagement, uh, the desire of, of their, their participant base. Um, but realistically, we see roughly five different solutions, very similar to what, um, what Sean and Jim mentioned earlier. But the first solution is nothing. You, you, you really don't have the demand. Potentially, you might not be in an industry that, that has millennials or um, you know, potentially you don't want to put an ESG uh, fund or a... a, a policy around the uh, the 401k plan, the investments themselves, uh, the idea is obviously you do nothing. Now, again, from a risk mitigation standpoint, from a liability standpoint, that, that there is no liability, there's no concern, there's no issue. Obviously, um, if you don't have the demand, you know, you don't need to create uh, a demand if there is no demand there. Um, second solution is if there is demand, uh, potentially create and use a one fund product solution. Um, again, potentially looking at a, a balanced or growth or a moderate growth portfolio that has ESG various in its components. Now, like Sean mentioned, it will not be specific to, you know, a, a 
a social environmental issue or a, a governance issue or um, clean water or global warming. Um, but again, you're getting the seal of the ESG. Um, again, the problem with that is, you know, it's one fund that, you know, potentially will that meet the needs of all millennials, all, you know, the pre-retirees or anybody who has the Maybe, maybe not, but again, that's one solution. Um, the next possible solution would be implement an ESG risk-based portfolio. So maybe you have ESG aggressive, an ESG balanced, and an ESG conservative. So regardless of whether your uh, employees are um, looking at uh, investing in ESG, they could look at a more aggressive portfolio or a more conservative portfolio, and, and again, tier that for them. So it's not like a one-size-fits-all, of a risk-based portfolio. Um, option four, uh, again, is self-directed brokerage. You know, there's a lot of product right now that's out there that, you know, want to invest in just global warming uh, concerns. If you want to invest in, you know, anti-guns, anti-tobacco, um, you know, uh, self-directed brokerage is an option that you can look at to be very specific to tie your ESG goals to exactly to your account. Um, again, when it's ETF, electronic traded funds, whether it's mutual funds, whether it's stocks, um, a self-direct brokerage is, is such that you can do that as well. And then again, last that, um, like, like Sean and Jim mentioned, is an integration of ESG on your, on your entire plan. In, in fact, in your entire company, um, Sean mentioned an ESG committee. Um, that not only could be for the plan, but that could be for the company as a whole. So, um, you know, that's what we're seeing, you know, five solutions. And ranging from, you know, doing nothing to, you know, full integration of, of ESG into your company. Sean, uh, Jim, do you have any other uh, takeaways with regard to what you're seeing with other plan sponsors? I don't have a lot to add to that. See, that was pretty comprehensive and well laid out. What I might share is just a couple of anecdotal stories because, you know, we've had the fortune of having these conversations with a lot of large plan sponsors for a long time. And uh, we had a you know, this, this gets to the demand issue. Oftentimes you don't know there's demand until it's, it's there. Right. And what ends up happening sometimes for plan sponsors is um, by not being proactive and at least thinking through these issues before the demands on you. Maybe you otherwise wouldn't have done if, if you had thought more deeply about it. So a good example of that is we work with a large, beverage manufacturer down in the southern United States and a uh, very global, very large organization. And we had this conversation with them many years ago and said, hey, you know, just want to talk about this. This is probably something you're you're hearing about. And they're like, no, we're not hearing about it at all. And they, they sat down and we sat down with the Treasury Department and talked to them about what we're seeing globally and this this idea of really implementing something even before the demands there just in case it were to uh, be at their doorstep and they said yeah we appreciate this but but I think we're good and no less than two months later I get a call from them saying hey can you go over that with us again because they had made an acquisition and they had a now a, a number of stakeholders in their organization that were used to having some kind of sustainable or socially responsible fund in their 401k and so now all of a sudden it was a big issue for them and they had to scramble and they had just got done spending millions of dollars redoing their their whole 401k plan and they didn't want to start adding new funds to the program and so it was really one of those things where uh i, I give a lot of credit to the plan sponsors that are you know joining this and thinking about this issue before it's the demands on your doorstep because it is definitely something that you want to think through what you want to do as an organization because this is really about engaging your participants engaging your employees and not only do you have to think about this as a plan sponsor or i'm sorry as a as an organization you have to think about it as a plan sponsor and as a fiduciary so um so i guess my my key point there is even if your propensity is to do nothing because the demand isn't there thinking through what might be the best solution for you if it does come your way is, is actually a really good process that I would 